Number 10, Scarlet Witch. Okay, so Scarlet Witch might not be as hated as some when it comes to the general public, but she sure has had her share of hate when it comes to the mutant population. In issue number 7 of 2019's X Men, mutants even expressed their hate as part of a ceremonial rite of passage called the Crucible that involves revisiting her story. Young mutants who have likely only experienced what happened as a story profess their hatred for Wanda and call her pretend. Pretender, pretender, pretend her. I hate her so much. I hate her so much. And I'm like, no, she wasn't meaning to be a pretender. And before this, Rogue was the one who led the charge when it came to the mutant community, blaming Scarlet Witch. Rightly, albeit maybe not fairly, for the whole M Day ordeal and threatening the very existence of mutant kind. Number 9. Thor and the Avengers During the Fear Itself event, Thor was struggling with his place in the world. He was hated because the events of Siege, while not his fault directly, had not only caused destruction in Asgard, but also in neighboring Earth residing communities. Many of the people living in one of the towns resented the superhero community for causing danger to come to them. We've seen this a lot actually in movies and comics too. Some had their homes destroyed and couldn't even afford to rebuild, choosing to sell and move out rather than stay and wait for the superheroes to attempt to save the day again and help them rebuild. Not all of the town felt this way, but then a coming war between Midgard and Asgard also was approaching, fueling some of the hate from the public in regards to Thor and the Avengers team. Of course, Asgard was only aiming to destroy Earth to prevent the serpent from feasting on all of the human spheres and becoming even more powerful. But this only added insult to injury as the serpent, you know, was also already bent on conquering and devouring Earth himself. I mean, Thor recovered, but this was a pretty tough time for the Thunder God and a pretty tough time to be anyone from Asgard or any sort of Norse mythology. In the end, it was really only his self-sacrifice that managed to redeem him. Cause he died. But then he's, then he was okay. You know how it goes. Number eight, Silk. Silk is Cindy Moon. She has similar powers to Peter Parker's Spider-Man, including a built-in danger sense, but she can actually also produce her own organic webbing, which I think actually is really cool. This is probably the least gross, I think. She even sometimes uses the skill to spin herself a disposable silk suit spider costume. After her and Peter dated or hooked up for a bit, she ended up settling back into her own life and searching for her family. She had been locked up in a bunker for years, long story. Anyways, like Peter, much later on, she also got some of the J. Jonah Jameson treatment when it came to her superhero persona of Silk. Though even Jameson himself very much liked Cindy for a time in volume one of her series when she was working for him. Number seven, Green Lantern. When comics made the choice to turn Hal Jordan into Parallax and had him basically threaten the entire DC universe, they also created a world of hate for him, with some readers, but mostly within the comic book world, and especially in the realms of the superhero community. Even today, more than 20 years later, people still bring this up in the comics. People are not over it. They're like, remember that time you pretty much like almost killed everybody? He's like, geez, guy can't get over that stuff. Number six, Spider-Man. He's a menace. At least that's what JJ would have us think. But the fact of the matter is that a lot of people in New York read the Daily Bugle and trust what it has to say. So when they do stories about Spider-Man being a criminal, a murderer, a dang menace, people are inclined to believe those words, which has led to a lot of problems for Spider-Man. And let's not forget the amount of times people have tried to frame him. Right from the beginning, Chameleon himself tried that ploy, and we've seen it happen a few more times in the comics as well. He's just so frameable, Spider-Man, isn't he? Number five. Lex Luthor and General Zod. Lex Luthor has hated Superman for a variety of reasons over the years. In the classic Superman stories, he held Superman responsible for making him bald. In others, he felt that Superman humiliated him at their first meeting. Sometimes it's narcissism, making him hate anyone who is more beloved than him, and often it is because he believes that Kryptonians make humanity weak and compliant. He hates Superman because he is an alien god who he doesn't trust, which is why it shouldn't be surprising that Lex also hates the Kryptonian General Zod. In the last Son of Krypton arc, General Zod comes to Metropolis and takes it over, capturing the Justice League and banishing Superman to the Phantom Zone. Now, 
Lex isn't the type to allow some filthy alien to take over his hometown. And also sensing an opportunity to be seen as the city's savior, he assembles a team to defeat Zod and his men and send them back to the Phantom Zone. He is so intent on getting rid of Zod that when Superman returns, Lex even teams up with the Man of Steel to save the city, retaking the Fortress of Solitude by his side. Of course, he eventually tries to betray Superman, but he was smart enough to know Zod was the priority. Number 4. Joker and Bane in another of Bane's plans to break Batman, he took over the city and held Alfred the Butler hostage. When Robin tried to get into Gotham, he was captured and Bane broke Alfred's neck in front of the boy Wonder, killing the Butler. This of course earned him hatred from Batman, Robin, and the entire Bat family. But also someone rather unexpected, the Joker. In the first issue of Joker Warzone, the clown prince of crime breaks into Arkham Asylum where Bane is hooked up to a machine that is draining him of his venom. Joker lets Bane know that he is angry because Alfred was Bruce's last parental figure and that hurting him would have hurt Batman more than anything else. And Bane chose to kill him in front of Robin instead of Batman. Joker hates Bane for wasting the best weapon that could ever be used against the Bat. Joker calls Bane pathetic and vows that someday, when he least expects it, he will kill him. Number 3. Red Hulk and the Abomination Thunderbolt Ross has been a longtime enemy of the Hulk, and was certainly an antagonist to the Green Goliath, but wasn't much of an outright villain. I mean, sure, he did try to shoot Bruce Banner on his wedding day, but these things happen. He did eventually become more villainous after the villain known as the Abomination killed his daughter, Betty. Around this same time, the Hulk was sent off planet by the Illuminati, and Ross felt like he had no purpose until he was approached by the villain group, the Intelligentsia. They offered him the means to have gamma powers if he agreed to work for them. He agreed and was transformed into the Red Hulk, a villainous variation on the original. He wasted no time in hunting down the Abomination, finding him in a small Russian village, and attacking him, beating him to a pulp for what he did to Betty. The fight resulted in the village and all of its inhabitants being killed, but Ross didn't care, and even ended the fight by shooting and killing Blonsky with a gamma pistol. Ross eventually left the Intelligentsia and operates in a bit more of a grey area now, but his final confrontation with Abomination stands out as a fun start to his career as a Hulk. Number 2. Venom and Carnage After Eddie Brock was put in jail, he was made cellmates with notorious mass murderer Cletus Cassidy. The two did not get along, with Eddie despising Cletus for his twisted history and worldview, and Eddie decided to brutally beat him several times while they were imprisoned together. Cletus planned to murder Brock one night, but was interrupted when the Venom symbiote broke Eddie out of jail. The symbiote was pregnant and gave birth to the Carnage symbiote that bonded with Cletus, creating a villain that was even more powerful than Spider-Man and Venom. Venom, although a murderous villain at this point in his history, was extremely reverent to innocent lives and hated Carnage so much that he even teamed up with Spider-Man, his arch enemy, to help the webbed wall crawler take out Cletus and his symbiote. Venom is now more of an anti-hero than villain, but his rivalry with Carnage has been a consistent element of the character to this very day. Number 1. Magneto and the Red Skull Magneto was a Jewish man who lost his entire family and was sent to Auschwitz by the Germans during World War II. The Red Skull was a high-ranking member of the National Socialist German Workers Party, whose more commonly used name I'm not allowed to say on this channel, so it makes sense that Magneto would really hate the Red Skull's guts. We witnessed this in Captain America number 367 when the Red Skull was suddenly attacked in his office by the Master of Magnetism. Magneto demanded to know if Red Skull was the same Red Skull who was operating during World War II. Upon Red Skull's confirmation that he was the same man, Magneto informed him that he had sworn revenge against anyone who had been involved with the German army in World War II. Seemingly unable to read the room, Red Skull decides that this is the moment to pull a we're not so different, you and I, and points out that Magneto's willingness to kill humans who he considers inferior to mutants in order to further the advancement of his people who he considers a master race makes him pretty hypocritical. Magneto is not a fan of this admittedly kinda valid point, and responds by capturing Red Skull and locking him in a bomb shelter all alone with no means of escape and nothing to survive on but 10 gallons of water. Magneto tells Red Skull that he wants to make him suffer as he made others suffer during the war 
and that he is going to wish that he had killed him. He then leaves him to his fate alone in the dark. Number 10, Wonder Man. I mean, Wonder Man was literally the guy to organize the Revengers team. This happened because Wonder Man, aka Simon Williams, believed after years and years of having a rough go, to put it lightly, that the Avengers were actually to blame for pretty much all the negative parts of his life. He decided ultimately that the Avengers had to be stopped and put a team together known as the Revengers. The Revengers were literally created to take out the Avengers, and they almost succeeded too. At first, First, Wonder Man's Revengers attacked the New Avengers team. While initially the New Avengers held their own, ultimately the Revengers prevailed and actually won that fight. Confident in their ability, the Revengers then headed for the main Avenger team. This is where they ended up failing, with Wonder Man being imprisoned while in his ionic form. Let's also not forget that Wonder Man was initially introduced as a supervillain, who himself fought against the Avengers to begin with. So he also literally started out as an antagonist to them, albeit one who was eventually redeemed deemed and ended up ultimately joining the team he had been sent to destroy. But you know, he's got a long history with them. And friends, before we move on to our next spot on this list, if you love what we're doing here at Top 10 Nerd, why not show us you love us by clicking that subscribe button. Number 9, Young Avengers. Hate might be a strong word here considering that the Young Avengers, you know, are inspired by the main Avengers team, but you can't deny that the Young Avengers at least have some beef with the team that inspired them. At least, you know, they did when they first formed. The Young Avengers as inspiring teen heroes actually wanted to learn from their mentors and sought to be trained by them, actually reaching out to the Avengers. However, when they tried to reach out to, you know, get training and get some help and pointers, they ended up being turned away, with Captain America actually refusing to teach them anything initially and even attempting to discourage their attempt to become heroes. In fact, initially the Avengers even tried to prevent the Young Avengers from facing Kang and even sided with Kang against the Young Avengers member Iron Lad. Kang had in essence shown the Avengers some awful visions of the potential future, were Iron Lad not to fulfill his destiny in becoming Kang, and the Avengers were basically convinced by this. Fortunately, the Young Avengers weren't so easy to lock away, so they managed to escape confinement and prepare for the battle against Kang. Although Iron Lad would ultimately return to his own timeline, resigned to become Kang one day. Times have changed and the Young Avengers have largely become accepted by the Avengers who came before, but the start there, it was kind of rocky. Number 8, Hulkling. During the beginning of Empire, you could definitely argue that Hulkling kind of hated the Avengers, at least for a moment, considering that they were siding with the Alliance's enemies, the Kotati. However, once the Avengers learned the truth of the Kotati's plans and their vendetta to, in essence, destroy all organic life, it became clear to them that the Alliance were actually more the side to ally with in this intergalactic fight. In fact, the whole reason that Hulkling had, in essence, been able to bring together the long warring empires of both the Skrull and and the Kree to create the alliance, other than you know his parentage being a Kree Skrull hybrid, born both of Skull royalty and a celebrated Kree war hero, was because of this unified threat, the Kotati. Number seven, Spider Man. Well, Spider Man has himself been an Avenger that doesn't mean he's always seen eye to eye with the team or always gotten along with them. In fact, at one point they kind of betrayed his trust, or at least you know one of them did. Yep, I'm talking about Iron Man during Civil War, the first Civil War. War, baby. It was during Civil War that Spider-Man was convinced by Tony Stark to reveal his true identity to the world as part of a push for the Superhuman Registration Act, revealing that Spider-Man, aka Peter Parker, stood with Iron Man, aka Tony Stark, and supported the act. Stark believed that for accountability's sake, it was actually really important to reveal their civilian identities to the public. Of course, this almost immediately backfired, with a hit being put out on Peter, and after an attack on his life went wrong, and May ending up in critical care. It it would ultimately be Peter's choice to side with Avenger Tony Stark that would result in Mary Jane and himself making a deal with Mephisto to restore Peter's secret identity and save Aunt May in exchange for their marriage. So yeah. Number 6, Eternals. The Eternals and Avengers both seem to have beef with each other when the two teams clashed in AXE, which for those who are unfamiliar was the summer to winter event of 2022. Avengers versus X-Men versus Eternals or AXE or AXE. 
Judgment Day. Here, the X-Men were being attacked by the race known as the Eternals, who were now being led by the manipulative Druig. To combat this, some members of the Eternals team sought to bring back one of their gods, the Celestials, in the hopes that, you know, the Celestial would right all the chaos going on and basically punish Druig. They kidnapped Tony Stark and worked with him to resurrect a fallen Celestial, essentially breathing new life into it and creating kind of a kind of a new Celestial altogether. Iron Man agreed to help, but based the nervous system off his own. And ultimately, when the progenitor woke and came online, it gave the entire Earth 24 hours to prove that they were worthy of life. The Eternals and the X-Men then both kind of looked at Tony and, well, I mean, kind of blamed him for this in part. I mean, he did base it off of himself, so yikes. Number 5. Cyclops and Wolverine Wolverine has had quite the luck with the ladies over his incredibly long history, but despite that, he couldn't seem to let one girl go. That girl was Jean Grey. Jean Grey has pretty consistently declined the advances of our short, temperamental Canadian in favor of her boo, Scott Summers, the consistent leader of the X-Men, Cyclops. They just make for a better couple, despite Scott being kind of the worst sometimes. And Wolverine? He just can't stand that fact. He is pretty consistent even to the point of being problematic with his advances towards Jean despite her constant rejection. And Cyclops is no pushover. He is, or I guess was, a boy scout, but he is also a pretty strong-willed leader and not someone who takes behavior like Wolverine's lightly, which has led to many clashes between the two over the years. Pretty immature rivalry over their teammates, which has gotten bloody on way too many occasions and is pretty disrespectful to the third person involved, starts as a basis, but over their history, these two have butted heads over more important things. For example, there was a pretty serious difference of opinions in how the X-Men and the students of the school they are an integral part of should be led, causing the schism story. Or there was the whole X-Men versus Avengers thing where Wolverine seemed to choose the other heroes over his own mutant family. Number 4. Green Arrow and Arsenal Oliver Queen and Roy Harper's falling out as one-time partners is a bit of a tragic ordeal, and it's mainly because of Roy's infamous decline into the world of substance abuse. Originally, Roy was Green Arrow's first sidekick, Speedy. He was an orphan that Oliver Queen took in. Oliver basically raised Roy. Roy would also join up with the Teen Titans, and he had a good thing going as a member of the Teen Titans, even dating Donna Troy. But a while later, the Titans disbanded, he broke up with Donna Troy, and Oliver ran into serious financial troubles and basically started neglecting Roy, going off around the country with Green Lantern and Black Canary. This was the trigger that sent him down the path of addiction. Oliver came back from a mission to find Roy red-handed and instead of supporting or comforting his adoptive son, Oliver disowned him, kicked him out on the streets, and gave him a swift punch to the face. As you can imagine, this led to a lot of resentment between the two and Roy struck out on his own, struggling all the while with his issues. He would go on to become Arsenal and eventually Red Arrow, with the bad blood between him and his adopted dad being smoothed over eventually, but those problems of his addiction and Green Arrow's knack for abandoning Roy came back with a vengeance. Now I gotta change the subject because it's honestly, it's honestly pretty depressing. Let's move on. Let's move on. Yeah. Number three, Tim Drake and Damian Wayne. Of all the Robins, Tim and Damian have had the most touchy of relationships. It all started when they first met. Tim Drake was the Robin, and Damian, being the son of Batman, decided that apparently the only way to claim what he called his birthright of the Robin mantle was to literally try and take Tim's life, which is a perfect indication of why he was not at all suited to be the Robin. The little psycho. Damian laid an unholy beat down on Tim with his much more advanced combat skills, almost bringing Tim to the pearly gates. Luckily, he didn't actually achieve this, but it set a tone for the rivalry between these two, especially as they both took on the Robin mantle. As a side note, Tim had to earn Bruce's love. He worked for it, and with his father Jack, he also had to work for that. For Tim, love is something you have to earn and is never unconditional. And this little jumped up spoiled brat of comes in here talking about his birthright with Bruce actually giving Damien the love that he didn't really earn. It rubbed Tim the wrong way. Eventually, Damien claimed the Robin title solely for himself and Tim set off as just Red Robin. They've also repaired the relationship somewhat, but of the members of the Bat Family, I think there is always tension between these two. Number 2. Spider-Man 
and Venom. Now this may seem like a cop out because well it kind of is. Venom was one of Spider-Man's greatest villains. Basically the literal antithesis to Spider-Man. Venom had almost an obsession for Spider-Man. Like a really really dangerous symbiotic ex-girlfriend. Venom almost pined for the connection he lost with Spider-Man. When the rejected alien bonded with Eddie Brock, whose life was arguably ruined by both his own and Spider-Man's actions, the combo made for a deadly villain who hated Spider-Man with almost every fiber of his being. When Venom started to lean into the role of being an anti-hero, the only real reason these two began to leave each other alone was because Venom moved across the whole country to San Francisco. I guess they just needed some space because over time they began to accept each other, becoming reluctant allies at times, especially in the absolute carnage story, which finally began to see their relationship heal. Eventually, in the aftermath of the King in Black story, almost seeing each other as brothers. The tension is still in the air to a degree if you ask me, and crazy exes be like that sometimes. Number 1. Emma Frost and Jean Grey Jean Grey and Emma Frost. They are powerful female heroes amongst teams of predominantly male heroes and they are not afraid to show just how capable they are. They are so similar and yet so different which naturally leads to both friendship and rivalry at the same time. Emma Frost is known for being cunning, assertive and brutally blunt. She's also no stranger to going a little dark. Jean Grey on the other hand is known for being more empathetic, gentle and kind. Except when she was Dark Phoenix. When they first met in the Dark Phoenix saga, Emma was literally part of the villainous Hellfire Club that manipulated Jean to become the Dark Phoenix in the first place. It is not a good way to start a working relationship. Then there is the pretty large fact that these two share a big old love triangle with Cyclops. I think it's safe to say that Cyclops prefers Jean. She is the one who is consistently stuck in his heart. But but that didn't seem to stop him from basically telepathically cheating on Jean with Emma. And then actually being with Emma when him and Jean broke up and Jean died. But like I said, Jean was always in his heart which doomed him and Emma from the start. Emma Frost and Jean Grey have continuously argued and battled over a wide array of issues throughout their history but at the end of the day, these two women are actually friends. Friends that have genuine respect for each other and who have had each other's back. They even teamed up together to save Aurora Monroe, Storm, at one point which displayed both their strengths and weaknesses as incredibly similar but starkly different mutants. Number 10. Medusa You could argue that Medusa really hated the X-Men at one point. Adam talked a bit about the Inhumans vs X-Men event on part 1 of this list. While Black Bolt is their king, Medusa is or was at the time their queen. She herself had a pretty feisty exchange with Emma Frost during the conflict who was leading her own team of X-Men, with the two women's conflict coming to blows and them actually fighting one another directly during the Inhumans versus X-Men story. Following that conflict being resolved, Medusa even stepped down from her role as queen as a result. That's how much this whole thing affected her. The conflict with the X-Men left her feeling as though she had failed her own people by leading them into this war. And friends, before we move on to our next spot on this list, if you love what we do here at Top 10 Nerd, why not show us you love us by clicking that subscribe button. Thank you. Number 9. War Machine There was a time when War Machine actually led his own team of sentinels against mutants. Or at least to observe and track mutants, which is still pretty bad honestly. Sounds shocking right? But it's true. He was chosen to become the direct commanding officer of his own sentinel squad. Most sentinels of course don't need a commanding officer because they themselves are like AI robots which are used to attack and target mutant kind. But in this case the sentinels in question were piloted armor. The squad was known as Sentinel Squad 1. One, o N E, and they were part of one, which stands for Office of National Emergency. One was basically activated by the President of the United States following the events of M Day. While Rhodey himself is not known for really hating mutants, his actions here were definitely antagonistic towards them, even if he didn't perhaps see it that way at the time or intend it to be like that. I mean, you know, to Rhodey, he's just working with the government, but also, I don't know, man, I feel like if you're watching mutants, that's pretty messed up. Number eight, Doctor Strange. What? The X Men and Doctor Strange have beef? When? How? Why? Well, we're not talking about Stephen Strange here, but former Doctor Strange, Clea Strange, the wife of Stephen. The sort of wife of Stephen. Sort of. It's complicated. Basically his longtime love interest, who he is separated from, but who every now and then comes back to remind everyone, you know, she's still his wife, even though th that point kind of seems murky at best. And I don't think they were ever actually formerly married, but you know, they do or did have rings. So, yeah, 
Clea during the Hellfire Gala of 2022 had some very tense moments with the mutants, not really specifically the X-Men as they stand now, but at least a former member of the X-Men, Emma Frost. Clea came to the gala and requested to speak to Emma in the hopes that she might be able to help her resurrect Steven, who had recently died during the events of the death of Doctor Strange. It had just been revealed to the world that mutant kind had the power to basically bring back their dead, and Clea was basically hoping they might be able to help her in reviving Steven. But of course, Emma refused. <laughs> Instead, actually suggesting that maybe Clea would be a better Sorcerer Supreme than her husband was. Now, despite this being technically a compliment, Clea did not take the response very well. She was actually pretty peeved. Number 7, Alpha Flight. After consulting with our resident Alpha Flight expert, Andrew, I learned that as I suspected, Alpha Flight has had beef with the X-Men, mainly involving Wolverine. Despite the fact that Wolverine himself has been a member of Alpha Flight, the team have also constantly made attempts to kidnap Wolverine and take him back to Canada, because they basically have seen him as essentially government property. Well, that doesn't sound very polite or very Canadian-like to me as a fellow Canadian, but that's basically the tea there. Eventually, Wolverine and Alpha Flight would work things out, and currently they are on very good terms with the Knucklehead, but there was a time when they had a very real problem with the X-Men and some serious jealousy issues, it seems, in regards to their attachment to Wolverine, which I mean, I kinda get. Wolverine's pretty cool. <laughs> if he was on my team too and he was like, hey, I'm leaving, I'd be like, no, get back here. I don't know if I'd kidnap him though. I feel like that's not very nice. Shouldn't go around kidnapping people. Number six, Miss Marvel. Carol Danvers now known as Captain Marvel, has had a complicated history with mutant kind, to put it mildly. Initially, her powers were stolen by then mutant villain Rogue. Rogue didn't even really mean to actually steal Carol's powers per se, it was kind of just a result of her attacking Carol that this happened because, I mean, that's what Rogue does, those are his, her powers, she like takes the power away from people, takes their life energy, and you know, at the time her powers were very volatile and uncontrollable. She since has come into her own and even has become a hero, and is actually more well known for being a hero than a villain at this point I'd say. And while even after Rogue became a hero, many of her powers, to this day even, still came and come from Carol Danvers, who was then known as Miss Marvel, there has also been a history of friendship with Carol and the X-Men team. Professor X and the X-Men actually took Carol in after she lost her memories and her powers following her interaction with Rogue. And Carol actually fought alongside the X-Men as part of their team for quite some time, basically being an ally to them, despite not even being a mutant. But she has definitely had a big beef with Rogue in the past, and Rogue has been an X-Man. We cannot deny either of these facts, so hence why she's on this list. Number five, Barry Allen and Cobalt Blue. Barry Allen was an ordinary man until he was struck by lightning and doused with chemicals that granted him super speed, allowing him to become the Flash. But he is actually not an only child. On the night that Barry was born, his mother Nora gave birth to another little boy. At the same time, another woman named Charlene Thawne was also in labor. The attending physician was drunk and had sent his nurse home for the night and was unable to save Thawne's child when he got tangled in the umbilical cord. The doctor's solution to this was to take Barry's twin from the Allens and tell them that he had been stillborn. He gave Malcolm to the Thawne family, who raised him as one of their own. Malcolm's adoptive family was kinda sketchy, as they had a power called the Blue Flame, which they used to heal people before selling them fake cures as a con. As he was adopted, he did not have this power, something for which his other family members constantly taunted him about. Malcolm found out that he was adoptive and set off to find his real family. He began stalking Barry, even witnessing the accident that turned him into the Flash. He became jealous that Barry had everything Malcolm thought that he deserved, and grew to hate Barry. He learned a way to use the Thawne Blue Flame power despite being adopted, and became one of the Flash's villains, Cobalt Blue. Number 4, Professor Xavier and Juggernaut. Professor Xavier, while having done some not so great things in his life, is still, for all intents and purposes, mainly considered a superhero. And honestly, while we'll be focusing more on the time here when Juggernaut was a supervillain, even he in the comics seems to have turned over a somewhat of a new leaf, moving more into being an anti-hero, if not like a full-on superhero himself, I would say. Juggernaut was given his powers initially by Sidorak, and while he has moved away from this god in the present day in terms of acting as his avatar, Juggernaut was at one point acting as such, with his powers intrinsically tied to Sidorak. Because of 
his alignment and because of years of history between the two, Professor X and Juggernaut would always butt heads whenever they met up, often even fighting against each other. If not always directly, many, many times indirectly at the very least. Even when Juggernaut became a more of a heroic figure, Xavier was still wary of letting him on the mutant island of Krakoa, because despite being family, albeit step family, Xavier still didn't want Kane around and he used the excuse that he wasn't a mutant. Harsh. Fortunately, the two have continuously over the years been moving towards a healthier and healthier relationship. So here's hoping that continues to grow between them and they don't hate each other so much anymore. Number three, Martian Manhunter and Malefic. Alien space cop John Jones was born on the planet Mars where he lived with his wife and daughter. Like all Martians, John had the power to psychically communicate with other members of his species, but his twin brother Malefic was born a mutant who didn't possess this ability. As the years passed, Malefic became more and more resentful and hateful of Martian culture and started devising a plan to end the race. John's idyllic life came to an end when Malefic created a virus that made the Martians burst into flame when they used their psychic powers, resulting in the death of everyone on the planet except John and Malefic. When a scientist on Earth attempted to make contact with Mars with the use of a transmitter, it instead transported John to Earth where he became the superhero Martian Manhunter. Malefic remained on Mars living in the ruins until he learned that his brother was alive on Earth, causing him to set out to try and finish his extinction of the Martian species. Malefic hates John because he hates all Martians. John hates Malefic because he killed everyone John ever knew and loved. Fair enough. Number two, Aquaman and Ocean Master. No matter what the continuity, these two have always been brothers in the comics and they have also always hated one another. Back in the day, the feud between the two happened because Orin, aka Arthur, got everything as a result of his birth, whereas Orm got nothing, Orm being Ocean Master. Because of this, Orm would end up seeking out powers based in magic so that he could finally triumph over his brother. Ha, take that, Aquaman, I got magic powers. That's me being Ocean Master. In the current continuity, Ocean Master felt that Arthur would not be a good king for Atlantis and sought to prevent him from taking the throne. Arthur here is the firstborn to the princess and future queen Atlanta. Here he was raised on land, whereas Orm, his half brother, is the son of Orvax Marius, king of Atlantis and queen Atlanta. And of course, being raised, you know, underwater, so he's more about that life. Being more of Atlantis initially than Arthur was, it would make sense that Ocean Master would hate Arthur, who spent most of his life initially living living on the surface world. Number one, Thor and Loki. Okay, you all know the gist of this one. Loki was born to the king and queen of the giants of Jotunheim, but due to him not being a giant, he was shamed by his society. Loki used some really elaborate time travel shenanigans in order to orchestrate the death of his father and his adoption by Odin of Asgard. He was taken to Asgard, but soon became jealous of his new brother, Thor, who was clearly favored over him by the citizens of Asgard. This got to a new level when he became jealous of Thor's relationship with Lady Sif. Loki spent several years trying to defeat Thor, either directly or through more convoluted means, like granting a prisoner absorption powers so he could become the absorbing man to fight Thor. The two have had moments of getting along over the years, but more often than not, these brothers find themselves in spectacular combat, with Loki continuously attacking Earth, simply because he knows Thor has a soft spot for it. Carnage and Joker. When it comes to Marvel and DC villain crossovers, many of you will probably first think of Joker's adversarial relationship with the Red Skull. But that one's been talked about a lot, and I'm also trying to limit the number of Joker entries on the list, so I'd rather talk about Joker's relationship with another Marvel villain, Cletus Cassidy, aka Carnage. In the Spider-Man and Batman comic of 1995, we get a story set on an alternate Earth where Spider-Man and Batman live in the same universe. Carnage in this story is a fan of the Joker, as he is the only other person who gets the joke that life is utterly meaningless, totally absurd, and madness is the only sane response. The two decide to start working together since they have so much in common, but things soon turn sour. Carnage soon becomes tired of Joker's complex and convoluted schemes, believing that it's more fun to just kill as many people as possible. Joker despises Carnage's lack of style, calling himself the Orson Welles of murder and comparing Carnage to David Hasselhoff. The two begin trying to kill each other, their team up over before it could ever really even begin. Number nine, Ultron and Doctor Doom. During the events of the first Secret Wars, the villainous robot Ultron was destroyed by Galactus. His lifeless body was found by Doctor Doom, who saw the amazing opportunity in front of him and repaired the robot, programming it to be his 
his loyal servant. Ultron served Doom for a while, but Doom eventually lost control of him. Ultron didn't take kindly to being forced to serve Doom and became the Latvarian dictator's enemy. They have fought several times over the years and many of the possible futures shown in Marvel feature Doom and Ultron still locked in battle. In Avengers of the Wastelands number one, Doom easily destroys Ultron who has retired to be a mechanic. The 2099 version of Doom was captured by Ultron and even teamed up with the Savage Avengers in order to get a chance to destroy his old enemy, showing that no matter what the timeline, these two simply will not get along. Number eight, Killer Croc and Bane. During the infamous Nightfall arc, Bane enacted a plan to break Batman and take over Gotham City. While his plan is in progress, he sees Killer Croc on a rampage on the news. He finds out that Croc had attempted a similar plan and had come pretty close to taking out Batman. So Bane decides that he should fight Croc in order to prove his worthiness. He attacks Croc and easily breaks his arm and beats him to a pulp. This leads to Croc hating Bane and vowing revenge, eventually tracking Bane to the sewers and attacking him, even ignoring a tied up Robin, favoring his revenge match over taking out one of Batman's allies. Bane beats Croc again without too much trouble, which only solidified Croc's hatred for the venom enhanced villain. Number seven, Gorilla Grodd and Deathstroke. This feud began in Titans number 11, when Slade Wilson's ex-wife Addie Kane was kidnapped by Vandal Savage, causing Deathstroke to try and rescue her. He found her being held at knife point by Gorilla Grodd, who took the opportunity to cut her throat in front of him. This of course made Deathstroke swear revenge on Grodd, and when he was hired by Blockbuster, the Nightwing villain, not the movie store, to go to Gorilla City to find him a new heart in the Birds of Prey hostage heart arc, Deathstroke took the opportunity to go rogue. He ditched the other members of his team and tore a path of destruction through the jungle, searching for Grodd. In the end, Grodd got away and Deathstroke was unable to avenge his wife. In the current DC continuity, Slade's wife is alive and well, so he and Grodd really have no beef. But it's a shame we never got to see this storyline resolved before the continuity was reset. Number six, Green Goblin and Hobgoblin. When the first Green Goblin, Norman Osborn, was presumed dead, one of his weapon stashes was found by Roderick Kingsley, a businessman and a criminal. He used the weapons and the journals he found to craft a villainous persona of his own, the Hobgoblin. When Norman read about this new goblin, he almost left his hiding spot in Europe to destroy Kingsley, enraged that someone had stolen his gimmick. When Osborn finally did return to New York, Kingsley was in prison, and he became enraged that Norman was living a life of luxury while he rotted in jail. He got word to Norman that he had a journal that proved Norman was the Green Goblin, and Norman was forced to break Roderick out of jail so he could get his hands on the infamous journal. The entire time they were working together, they were planning on betraying each other, and when Hobgoblin discovered that Osborn had taken over his companies and the majority of his fortune, the two psychos did battle, each intending to destroy the other. In the years since, the two have come to blows a few different times, never being able to bury their hatred for each other. Number five, Hawkeye. Look, Hawkeye is kind of just a bit of a jerk to everyone. And it makes a tiny bit of sense since he's constantly playing the compensation game with everyone else since he's just a guy with a bow and an arrow. But man, does he say some problematic anti-mutant garbage sometimes. In Secret Wars, for example, without showing any anti-mutant sentiment before, Hawkeye grabs Cyclops by the scruff of his shirt and screams in his face, you mutants stick together, huh? Well, sticking to a blood-soaked maniac like him doesn't speak well of you, pal. He was referring to Magneto and, well, fair point, Hawkeye, but what's all this you mutants talk. Look, I'm reaching for this one for sure, but in the Ultimate Universe, this sentiment is actually a bit more noticeable, and Hawkeye is certainly more of a jerk in general there. And he even took glee in taking out multiples of multiple men, although that was most likely because he was grieving. Look, just let me have this one, okay? Number four, Scarlet Witch. The Scarlet Witch is another unique choice for this list as she herself is indeed a mutant. But it's the fact that she is a mutant that is why she is on this list in the first place. It is a gross understatement to say that Wanda has not had the easiest life. Being an Avenger for years, the team that she has always been more inclined to anyways, this mutant saved the world on many occasions, but the end of the Scarlet Witch's marriage to Vision and the loss of her children caused a mental break Breakdown. A breakdown that coupled with her reality warping capabilities caused the passing of a number of Avengers. Once the heroes decided that she needed to be 
dealt with, she warped reality to a world where Magneto was in charge of everything. But in the climax of that story, Wanda, in an extremely emotional moment, basically revealed her hate for mutants stemmed from the fact that being one has caused her so much pain and grief. She hated herself for being a mutant, and with three words, she then relieved almost all the mutants on Earth of their mutant abilities, putting the entire race into endangerment. Number three, Tony Stark. Tony Stark, Iron Man, is on this list for an extremely similar reason to Captain America. As one of the leading men in the non-mutant superhero community, he makes some rather interesting decisions with some pretty selfish intent. Just like Captain America, I wouldn't say that Tony hates mutants or the X-Men, but I would say that he is usually ignorant to the horror which the X-Men have had to endure solely for being born different. For Tony, his example of not caring comes from the superhuman civil war. Iron Man attempted to recruit the X-Men during Civil War, and Emma Frost rightly pointed out that the Avengers did absolutely nothing when Genosha was attacked by the Sentinels. 16 million mutants passed away, and the other heroes, Iron Man included, were almost nowhere to be found. But the bigger elephant in the room is that the act that Tony is even supporting in his Civil War is the Superhuman Registration Act, which itself was just an evolution of the Mutant Registration Act that purposefully segregated mutants for being who they were born to be. Tony didn't really care about that. He cared about having powerful pawns on his side. He would rather have them on his side since they are useful to keep around, but he doesn't actually care about their struggle, and he doesn't even fully trust them. Also, an imposter Tony Stark called them all filthy muties once, so there's that. Number two, Reed Richards. Reed Richards of the Fantastic Four is not overtly a mutant or X-Men hater. The Fantastic Four that he is arguably the leader of have done their time and earned their place among the whole superhuman community, including among the mutants, as the Fantastic Four were one of the few groups who actively showed support of mutants, even if they didn't really know the best way to do so. But despite that, when things get personal, people's true colors come out for all to see. Reed may have not overtly said he hates mutants, but when it was revealed that Franklin Richards, his son, was actually a mutant, Reed then implanted a mutant nullifier into his own kid. He tried to fix Franklin despite the fact that he didn't try to do that when Franklin was not a mutant. I'd say that is pretty highly suspicious, and Susan Richards would probably agree with me. The people of the internet think this may have played a part in her trying to shack up with Namor. The worst part is Franklin wasn't actually a mutant. He just subconsciously used his vast powers to give himself an X gene. Reed needs to check himself. And finally, in at number one, the Eternals. This may be a bit of an interesting choice. The hate for the X-Men here is almost an involuntary thing. So the Eternals, a celestial created experiment and offshoot of humanity, have an eternal struggle against another offshoot, the Deviants. Eternals have hardwired programming to protect the Celestials and to correct access deviation. A recent revelation about mutants and deviants causes the new Eternal leader, a pretty sinister guy by the name of Druig, to decide that the mutants represented excess deviation. Thanks to that, war is declared on all mutants, including obviously the X-Men. Following their programming, Eternal Assassins come to Krakoa to destroy the Five. Massive War Machine Eternals called the Hex are unleashed on Krakoa. Uranus, one of the oldest and nastiest of the Eternals, is unleashed on Arako, and millions of mutants are taken out by the Eternals and their War Machines. Now to be totally fair, not all Eternals are on board with that. The main heroic Eternals, like Fina and Icarus, and Ajak and Makari, split themselves off as separate Eternal factions, trying to fix the situation. And when it reaches its crazy huge penultimate climax, things do go back to a bit of a normalcy, but for a while, their Eternals tried to wipe out the mutants simply for existing. Coming in at number 10 is Daredevil and the Punisher. These two crime-fighting street-level heroes have been butting heads for a hot minute. As with a lot of pairings on this list, to say that they absolutely despise each other is kind of pushing it. Matt Murdock and Frank Castle respect one another, even if their philosophies to crime fighting are in direct contradiction to one another. Matt is a pretty devout Catholic. He's a lawyer. He believes in the criminal justice system, and he's got a pretty strict no life taking policy, except for maybe like three instances that are pretty easy to justify. And then there's Frank. The criminal justice system not working is the very reason his family were taken from him. He believes the system 
to be broken and that his method of an eye for an eye, if you're a criminal you don't deserve to live, is ingrained into the whole philosophy of his hero activities. They couldn't be more different in terms of their morals, but running in the same circle and working in such close proximity to one another means that they are almost forced to work together. And because of that, they have eventually learned how to work together, even begrudgingly. And even though one thinks this horned crime fighter is naive, and the other thinks his skull themed colleague is a pervasion of the system he fights for, they still find a way to make it work. Number 9. Green Arrow and Hawkman The interesting thing about this somewhat surprising rivalry between two sometimes forgotten Justice League members, no offense to either, is that it's political. Other rivalries in comics are predominantly centered around modus operandi or love interests or personality differences, but this is just straight up that Green Arrow is pretty liberal and Hawkman, being either a centuries old reincarnated warrior prince or a space cop and sometimes both, is pretty damn conservative. The debates between these two heroes are pretty intense and they've both been wrong and right in different instances, which makes for very interesting storytelling and dynamics. Oliver Queen has been paired up with a space cop before, talking Hal Jordan Green Lantern, and while they butted heads from time to time during their travels together, Arrow's vocalization of his political views never seemed to bother the Lantern as much as it bothers Hawkman. Green Arrow is the kind of guy to demand Aquaman opens Atlantis to democratic elections, and Hawkman has been dubbed the ultimate conservative. They just do not work. Number 8. Batman and Guy Gardner I'm gonna be honest here, I think most of us are on Batman's side with this one. Batman has never really gotten along with Green Lanterns. I can't really tell you why because I don't know enough, so if you do know, share with us in the comments. But what I do know is that of all the Green Lanterns, Guy Gardner is known to be just the most unlikable. He's boisterous, cocky, a big old meathead, and he's got a stupid haircut. At first, Batman and Guy's rivalry was a bit of a joke, but then it pretty quickly changed to the point that only one hero was left as a joke. In 1987, we were given the Justice League International that had an awesome team of heroes including Shazam, Black Canary, Doctor Fate, Blue Beetle, Martian Manhunter, among others, with Batman as their appointed leader. Most people would agree that Batman is a more than qualified leader for a team like this, but one person who didn't take too kindly to Batman's leadership position and even wanted the role for himself was Mr. Gardner. After going on a big old rant and Batman calling Gardner a mongrel, the Lantern takes off his ring and decides to challenge the Dark Knight to a battle of fist the cuffs. One punch later and the lantern became the biggest laughing stock of the superhero community. Even Superman finds it funny. Number 7. Spider-Man and Wolverine Spider-Man and Wolverine doesn't really seem like a matchup you'd ever really expect. The funny thing is, they actually really work well together. Most of the time. It's really funny to see these two work together because you've got one of the most quippy, lighthearted, inspiring, and morally positive heroes teamed up with one of the most grumpy, rageful, animalistic, and brutal heroes in the Marvel landscape. The thing here is that while these two may clash, they're almost like brothers. Think like Wolverine as Big Brother and Spider-Man as Little Brother. Spider-Man and his snarky ways has a knack for getting under the skin of Wolverine's short temper. But I mean, we've also got instances of Wolverine hitting on Mary Jane, Spider-Man throwing Wolverine out of an Avengers tower window, and Wolverine being a little too stabby stabby with his claws for Peter Parker's no killing preferences. So they have definitely clashed and butted heads. And oh my god, there is also the Ultimate Universe versions of the characters who swapped bodies Bodies, with Wolverine being the most creepy creep ever to Peter's girlfriend. But for the most part, when these two heroes show up together, it's a treat. Number 6. Cable and Deadpool Similar to Wolverine and Spider-Man, most of the times when Deadpool and Cable team up together, it makes for an entertaining read. Almost for the same reasons as Wolverine and Spider-Man too, honestly. One smarmy guy who talks a lot, and one grizzled guy who talks very little always fun. But unlike those two, Deadpool was literally introduced as a villain specifically for Cable. In New Mutants number 98, Deadpool was hired by Tolliver to bring Cable down. The failure of this task put Deadpool on the warpath to try his darndest to bring this incredibly popular 90s hero down. They clashed multiple times, with Deadpool being one of Cable's constantly returning villains. As most people know, the hatred between these two characters didn't last forever, specifically ending when their respective series were cancelled and we were given Cable and Deadpool if looks could kill. Wade gets contracted 
by the One World Church to steal the Facade Virus, a new disease that turns everyone blue in order to achieve global equality with the side effect of people melting. Cable is also fully aware of the virus and has the goal of destroying it, which puts the two heroes head to head. Deadpool eventually gets the upper hand on Cable and gives it to the church, who turn around and infect both he and Cable with the virus just to test it out. Luckily, using his powers, Cable absorbs Deadpool into him, their genetic structure temporarily bonding, he vomits up Wade's essence, which heals back into his old body. Cable then uses his ship's teleportation matrix, which takes Deadpool along for the ride, and they appear in the same location, graphically bonded together before tearing themselves free of one another. The anti-heroes learn that due to being bonded genetically, Cable's machines recognize them as the same entity. So whenever either of them teleports, the other is along for the ride. So basically, the two are almost forced to eventually get along with each other and have a pretty cool, pretty cool relationship. They're kind of cool. Number 5. Emma Frost Emma Frost definitely is more inclined to give the Avengers the cold shoulder from time to time. To her, they deserve it. Emma's posed question when it comes to the Avengers and their relationship to mutant kind in the X-Men is, what have you done for us lately? Despite her and Tony Stark even having had an established on and off again romance between them, she has no qualms with also grilling him on why he and the Avengers team have never been around when mutants needed them most. Like you know, during the tragedy in Genosha. Like many mutants, Emma is left wondering why the Avengers haven't used you know, the fact that they're loved and celebrated celebrated the world over to stand with mutants and actively attempt to lift them up in the public eye and help fight against everyone that hates them. Tony's response to Emma's line of questioning is to point out that, you know, the Avengers have also had a hard time when it comes to their being accepted by the world. But Emma, she isn't buying it. And to be fair, mutant based heroes have traditionally had it, I think, a lot harder in comparison to human based heroes. So I think I stand with Emma on this one. Number four, Beast. Beast is having a wild time in his life right now in the comics. Oh, Hank, what happened to you? He is, in essence, Dark Beast. But you know, what if Dark Beast simply existed in the main continuity? Because we know Dark Beast is dead. So this can't be Dark Beast, sadly. We can't explain it away. Recently, Beast created his own council of beasts, and every time I see him do just about anything in the comments lately, I question if he is still sane and isn't somehow losing his mind. Beast is currently the head of X Force, which seems to have made him extremely paranoid against anything that isn't actively advertising itself as being very, very pro mutant, which is where the Avengers come in. They have never really been actively pro mutant, I would say, although at times they have worked to try and better understand their friends, the X Men, and have even stood with mutants and sometimes been an ally. They have also though done things to, in a roundabout way, kind of harm mutants. Or at least, you know, haven't always been there when mutant kind really could have used some help from the heroes. So whether or not they are on Beast's strike list, they are most likely a team that he would not care for. And honestly, even some of the folks Beast does seem to care for, or has cared for in the past at least, have seemingly popped up on his strike list of late. So just based on that, it's not looking good for the event standing with Hank. Number 3, Daredevil. Currently in the comics, Daredevil is the one with a target on his back when it comes to the hero the Avengers are currently going after. And get this, the reason they want to bring Daredevil to justice is because he's trying to reform villains. Like Wait, what? Apparently, we can chalk this feud up to a misunderstanding where so many hero versus hero conflicts obviously come from. The Avengers have simply assumed that Daredevil is looking to build up a villain army, as opposed to, you know, simply talking to him and seeing that Matt Murdock is, in fact, just trying to give villains a second chance. It's not a villain army, and it's actually trying to turn them into heroes, which you'd think the Avengers would kind of be all for, because it just helps everyone. If only they simply were willing to sit down and have a conversation instead of jumping to conclusions, but obviously they can't do that because comics. Number two, The Punisher. Frank Castle and the Avengers have had a rocky relationship throughout the years. And when you look at both their differing philosophies on heroism and their approaches to it, kind of makes sense. To the Avengers, Frank Castle tends to go too far. For The Punisher, there are many times when the Avengers simply don't go far enough. And it actually came to a point where the Avengers were hunting Frank and trying to capture him in Punisher Warzone. They even succeeded with Iron Man putting him in his own separate cell where he was kept a safe distance away from all other prisoners at all times, because Tony knew if Frank felt he had a chance, he would kill the criminals he was locked up with, which to be fair,
sure to Tony, he probably would. <laughs> Number one, X Men. The X Men hate the Avengers because while the Avengers also get a lot of flack sometimes for things, for the most part, they can't really relate when it comes to what it's like to deal with all the hate that the X Men and mutant kind just get for, well, being themselves and existing. Overall, the world loves the Avengers, but overall, the world tends to hate or judge the X Men just because they're mutants, even though the X Men have saved the world like multiple times. The differences between the two and just how much the Avengers didn't really get what was going on for the X Men was highlighted during the Avengers vs. X Men event, also known as AVX. Although, at least out of that, we got the Uncanny Avengers, which was a team that Captain America put together in the hopes of mending the relationship between the two teams, which, you know, kind of worked, I think. Number 10, Wonder Woman and Wonder Girl. Now, normally I would say these two actually really love each other, but today we're talking about rivalries, and there was a time when Diana Prince and Donna Troy actually had some beef. This happened actually before the two young women even really knew about it themselves. You see, in the Prime Earth continuity during the New 52 reboot, Donna was given a new backstory. I know, another new backstory. Well, her backstory initially seemed familiar to readers, with her being a child that Wonder Woman had once saved and brought back to Themyscira to be raised among the Amazons, the truth in this continuity was that Donna was actually created by Darano for the sole purpose of defeating Diana as a way of getting back at Hippolyta, her ex lover. Darano in the comics has the appearance of an old crone because her youth was stolen away by Hecate's magics, which Darano confronted when defending Hippolyta. If that's not enough of a conflict for you between Wonder Woman and the formerly known Wonder Girl, who was in essence like Diana's adopted kid sister, We've also met Thea in the comics, which is an alternate future version of Donna who rules the world after killing all her friends, Wonder Woman included. Donna confronted this evil future version of herself in the third volume of Titans in issue number 17. Number 9, Hal Jordan and his brother, Jack. Hal Jordan's father, Martin, was a test pilot for a Ferris aircraft until one day he crashed his plane and died. He left behind a wife named Jessica, as well as his sons, Hal and Jack. The event was so traumatic that Jessica made her sons promise not to follow in their father's footsteps. Jack respected his mother's wishes and became Coast City's district attorney. Hal, on the other hand, felt the need. The need for speed. More specifically, the need to break his promise to his mommy and become a test pilot. Jack believed that the stress of this caused their mother to die early, and he never forgave Hal for breaking his promise. Hal would eventually become Green Lantern and would often work alongside Jack while fighting crime, but the two would never really come to terms together, and Jack eventually died in a car crash. Womp womp. Number eight, the Summers Brothers. While the Summers Brothers have stood together in the past, they've also been quite divided. Divided as well. For this point, we're focusing on Scott, Alex, and Gabriel, aka Cyclops, Havoc, and Vulcan. With Vulcan, it's pretty easy to discuss the hatred his brothers have felt in the past. Because when you think about it, Vulcan kind of came back to attack the X Men and get revenge for what had happened to him and his team in the past when they attempted to rescue the first X Men team. However, that being said, while initially Scott and Gabriel were not on friendly terms, when Scott learned the truth of who Vulcan really was to him, a brother, and that Vulcan had, unbeknownst to Scott, had been part of the team that attempted to rescue him and the other X-Men from dread sentient mutant island known as Krakoa, Scott ended up more wanting to reach out to Vulcan as opposed to fighting against him. Havoc and Psyche also have their differences. At one point, Cyclops left his wife Madeline Pryor, prompting Havoc to step in and be there for Maddie, ultimately developing his own romantic relationship with his brother's wife, so that's kind of complicated. With years of comic history between them and and powers all based in a similar mutant power set. It's easy to see how sometimes the Summers brothers all struggle to get along with one another. Number seven, North Star and Aurora. Jean Marie and Jean Paul Barbier were separated early in life when their parents died in a car accident. Jean Paul ended up in foster homes before eventually becoming an Olympic skier, while Jean Marie ended up at a strict Catholic girls' boarding school, which was so traumatic that she ended up developing dissociative identity disorder, creating an alternate personality known as Aurora. They have a pretty rocky relationship with North Star, often coming into conflict with his sister's different personalities. So he's not fond of her Jan Marie personality, who is ashamed of her mutant powers and due to her religious upbringing is unaccepting of her brother being a gay man. On the other hand, her much freer Aurora personality doesn't like North Star because he commented on her relationship with Walter Lankowski and implied that she was a loose woman. The result of this was that one of her personas refused to talk to him, but the other was constantly needing support 
but being unaccepting of his lifestyle. They eventually buried the hatchet, but there was a huge chunk of their lives where they were constantly at odds. Number 6. Jimmy Hudson and Quicksilver This might seem like a weird thing to have on here since most people only know Quicksilver and his sister, Scarlet Witch, and you know, maybe their other half-sister, Polaris. But did you know that Quicksilver has a brother too? In the ultimate reality, that is. Here, Jimmy Hudson is the son of Wolverine and Magneto's wife, Magda Lencher. Magda and Wolverine get together, and Jimmy is born as a result. Quicksilver, on the other hand, is believed to be the son of Magneto and Magda, although it's also kind of implied that he might even be Wolverine's son, but that's a matter for another video. While Quicksilver had fought to protect Jimmy's life on a few occasions, this wouldn't stop the two from fighting one another viciously when Jimmy refused to go along with Quicksilver's master plan, and Jimmy's part in. It. Magda, however, arrives to prevent her two sons from killing each other just in time. Number 5. The Fantastic Four We discussed how much Reed Richards seems to dislike the mutants on part 1 of this list, and while Adam also touched upon all the times the FF have actually worked alongside the mutant team as their allies, as has Reed, remember when he made Dazzler that super pocket radio? Super cool. The whole team has actually gone up against the X-Men multiple times. In fact, they have two miniseries that are kind of based around that idea. The first one is from the 80s, Fantastic Four vs. the X-Men, pretty like on the nose there with the title. And the second is more recent from 2020, titled simply X-Men slash Fantastic Four. But it's less about X-Men and Fantastic Four coming together and a little bit more about why they clash with each other, at least at the beginning. The second ends with Professor X literally wiping Reed's mind of the knowledge of how to remove the X-Gene. No matter the reason, I don't think any of the FF would be down with involuntary mind wipes of any of their teammates. Reed included. Probably especially Reed. I mean, he needs that. He needs his mind to do science. <laughs> Number 4. Punisher The Punisher has an ongoing feud with one specific X-Man, and that's generally Wolverine. While the two have also teamed up together in the past, their relationship is often depicted as being rocky at best, and the two have come to blows multiple times. I would call this one more of an ongoing rivalry or feud that is mainly fueled by writers and fans who bicker about, you know, which one of them is the toughest around. Which one of them is the toughest guy? That's me being a fan that's just bickering about tough guys. Although I've definitely done that before and I don't sound like that when I do it. Or do I sound like that? Maybe I do. Personally, I would say Wolverine is tough for if I'm getting into that bickering argument debate with fellow nerds, both mentally and literally. But I also respect those who take Frank's side. After all, Frank is still a super tough person, and I'm not going to try to argue that he's not. Still really tough, so fair if you prefer Frank. Number 3. The Inhumans We've now talked about Black Bolt and Medusa specifically on the channel, but the Inhumans in general kind of have good reason to hate the X-Men, thanks to mostly Emma Frost. Initially, the Inhumans were actually trying to cancel the feud with the X-Men in Inhumans vs. X-Men, also known by the short form name of IVX. Truly, this story was a little bonkers in regards to, you know, making the conflict here make sense, but hey, if editorial comes to you and they say this is a story that has to happen, you kind of have to come up with some reason, so I don't even think we can blame creatives on this one. Because I'm pretty sure this story came from editorial wanting it to happen, not creatives pitching it. The reason we were given here for this weird fight is that the Terrigen Mists were released on Earth but ended up acting as basically a poison to the mutants. As such, the X-Men and mutant kind felt very targeted and they did some not so cool things in response to try to hurt the Inhumans. Emma Frost led the charge and she pumped everyone up by staging a telepathic public death of Cyclops, which wasn't real, he had already died at that point, and this whole thing was blown out of proportion when the Inhumans initially kind of actually tried to resolve this issue peacefully, but were attacked when they attempted to even extend an olive branch, which incited the war between the two groups. So while they didn't want to hate the mutants initially, that wasn't their goal here, it certainly did turn out that way by the end, or at least by the midway through the story. Though really, everyone turned on Emma when they learned how she'd manipulated them, the mutants, into fighting against the Inhumans, because yeah, not a great look for Emma Frost. Number 2. Hulk Hulk is well known for his beef with Wolverine. I mean, Wolverine literally first appeared in a Hulk comic where, you know, he was the villain, or at the very least, he was the antagonist of that tale. Hulk also at one point attacked the mutants during World War Hulk. Granted, he had less of a beef with the X-Men than he did with their at-one-time mentor, 
Professor X, who he wanted due to his connection with the Illuminati, because at that time the Hulk was like, the Illuminati messed up my life. But still, the fact that the X-Men were not involved in what had happened to Hulk on the planet Sakaar did not stop him from attacking other mutants initially. They basically had to shame Hulk into walking away in order to survive that fight, and even then Hulk seemed like he didn't really want to back down. And of course there have been other mutants in the past who have come to blows with Hulk besides. So. It's not even the only time that this has happened or the only folks that have been affected. Number one, Avengers. I mean, we touched on it a bit on part one of this list when Adam talked about Captain America and Iron Man. He even talked about another few Avengers as well that have beefed with the X-Men and mutant kind in general on his part one. If you want to know who exactly was included, I highly recommend checking it out. But I digress. You've probably heard of a little well-known event called Avengers vs. X-Men. This event stood to highlight some of the feuds between the two teams and their individual members that have been brewing for basically years. Chiefly though, the fight was over the Phoenix Force in terms of the story here. The Phoenix was returning to bond with, as the mutants believed, its current ideal host, Hope Summers. The Avengers wanted it gone. The two fought each other. Which now seems ironic since although the Phoenix has long been linked to mutants and mutant based stories and the Avengers were very anti Phoenix at that time, the Avengers now work with the Phoenix themselves as the force is currently bonded with Avenger member Echo. So love how they fought about it and then they were just like well that's uh you know now we're gonna use the Phoenix now it's our buddy weird. I've said it before and I'll say it again, I was raised to believe that the word hate is a very strong word so I'd more say that these are characters or groups who have actively had in my terms, a strong dislike for the X-Men or mutants in general at one point. Coming in at number 10 is Deadpool. Deadpool is a bit of a shocking way to kick off this list. He himself is like almost a mutant, but not actually a mutant, but he also says he's a mutant, but is then corrected by the actual mutants, and then sometimes people classify him as a mutant, but then others will classify him as not one. Do you understand why it's a little confusing? His mutant healing factor was derived from Wolverine's own, and he became who he is thanks to Weapon X, which are notorious for working on mutants. But whether he is a mutant or not, one thing is definitely true. Despite the fact that Wade has tried to count himself among their numbers, Deadpool finds the X-Men to just be a little too annoying for his own tastes. And that feeling basically just stems from the fact that they take things way too seriously. Where he takes almost nothing seriously, which means when he does work with them, it's usually not for a very long time. To say Deadpool hates anyone feels kind of wrong. I think he's just kind of insane, but he definitely finds them annoying. Number 9, Black Bolt. The Inhumans are essentially a species of mutants created by the Kree experimenting on humans a long, long time ago. One of the ways the Inhumans came to be was through the Terrigen Mists. When they're exposed to the mists, they gained powers and they would become an Inhuman. Unfortunately, a cloud of Terrigen Mists found its way to Earth and it turns out that these mists are incredibly deadly for the mutant population. The mutants eventually learned that they could change the composition of the mist in order to make it safe for mutants. but at the cost of not creating more Inhumans. The problem is, it didn't actually make sure that was okay to do with the Inhumans. They just started attacking the Inhumans, causing a conflict and causing Black Bolt to use his scream to take down Cyclops. This resulted in Emma Frost using Dazzler to attack Black Bolt and leave him imprisoned in limbo and without the ability to use his powers. The worst part is that if the X-Men just talked to the Inhumans, which they eventually do, the Inhumans are totally cool with figuring out a resolution. Solution. So I'm kind of on Black Bolt's side with this one. Look, I definitely know some of these choices will split people's opinions, so this is a perfect opportunity to invite you down to the comments to make sure you let me know your thoughts on my opinions here. I'm giving you my takes with examples, so I'd love to hear your well-informed opinions. Coming in at number 8 is Blade. Blade is someone who sometimes feels like he's relegated to his own corner of the Marvel Universe. A fact that he and mutants technically kind of share. But Blade is also pretty damn ruthless. His main self-appointed purpose in life is to eradicate vampires. It's what he lives for. But when one of those vampires is also a mutant, then it causes some discourse. During the X-Men Curse of the Mutants, the X-Men, and more specifically Cyclops, asked this vampire slayer for his expertise and assistance in dealing with their vampire problem. 
When the depowered mutant Jubilee was turned into a vampire though, Blade wanted to exterminate her, straight up, which shouldn't have been a surprise to anyone. But Blade also shouldn't have been surprised that the X-Men were not down for this course of action. The disagreement may not have been Blade hates the X-Men, but going to a vampire slayer and expecting him not to do what he does is a little annoying, don't you think? I think so. Number 7. Wasp Look, you may not agree with me on this one, and that's fine. But I will source one point of evidence that Wasp does not have a favorable view of the X-Men and mutants in general. In Uncanny Avengers, which followed the X-Men vs Avengers arc and ended with the passing of Xavier at the hands of Cyclops, Captain America decided that the best way to repair things was to put more mutants onto the Avengers and have the new team, led by Alex Summers, Havoc. That's Cap cherry picking the best looking mutants to represent them, but the addition of a few mutants to the Avengers under the ideology of a Professor X meant that some things changed around the Avengers mansion. Like when Rogue tried to replace a painting of the original Avengers with a painting of Xavier. It's in a bit of poor taste, sure, but when Wasp walked in on it happening, she was more than a little upset. And it seemed genuinely anti-mutant to me, just a little bit. And then she had this whole weird thing where she tried to design an X-Men themed clothing brand, including Cyclops themed glasses that seemed in poor taste, to help fund the Avengers. And she referred to UX types as being depressing and not optimistic. Then in issue number 8 of that series she makes another comment about the quote X-Men types and how they are keeping secrets. She just makes all these little snide comments about the mutant members of the team. She definitely has some kind of hate going on here. I don't care what you say, it's true. Wasp acts like all mutants are superheroes, for sure, but superheroes who don't know what they're doing. And that's rude. Number 6. Captain America Captain America does not hate mutants. He stands against inequality, it's one of his things. Fighting for the little guy. But gosh darn it, he sure seems to not care about them or their cause. Captain America and the Avengers in general don't usually think of the whole race of mutants when they make decisions, and that often leads to catastrophic events. A prime example being Avengers vs X-Men. The X-Men knew from the very beginning that the Phoenix Force was coming to join with Hope Summers to revive the mutant species, and that if it didn't find Hope, it would destroy the Earth. They knew this because the mutant Cable went to the future, where the Avengers had succeeded in quote, protecting Hope from the Phoenix Force, and it was bad. Cyclops made this pretty clear to Captain America and the Avengers, but they didn't trust the X-Men, this group of powerful mutants with decades of experience with the Phoenix Force, and who have hosts of the Phoenix Force among their ranks. The subconscious anti-mutant prejudice that Cap holds, coupled with his self-righteousness, causes him to not trust mutants and to think that he knows better than them. It's subtle for sure, but it's there all the same. Captain America has been at the center of many debates due to his willful negligence in regards to the mutant struggle. He doesn't hate mutants, but he also takes no noticeable action in their favor. Nor does he like it when the X-Men threaten to overturn the current peace, even if it's for the betterment of their own species. But he does create the Unity Squad, so there's that. Number 5. Deadpool While movie going audiences may love Deadpool, not everybody does. Not only is he considered a major menace within the superhero community, who no one really wants to team up with, sadly, but his disregard for human life and his violent nature also make him feared by your average civilians in the comic book world as well. Number 4. Booster Gold Although he does for a time end up achieving celebrity status, Booster Gold is still probably one of the least liked superheroes across the board in the DC universe. Likely because his heroics all appear to be for the fame. This doesn't of course stop him from becoming famous, but once people find out that he's kind of a sham with stolen future tech and, and yet a man from the future with really no relevant information to share with those in the past, many of the public often seem to be finding themselves rolling their eyes at him as much as the superhero community does. So really no one likes Booster Gold, poor dude. Number 3. Batman Now I know what you're thinking, wait, but everybody loves Batman. I would offer that more people fear him than love the bat, and while he may be remarked as a hero by civilians in Gotham, this isn't always the case. In Christopher Nolan's Batman universe, Batman even had to go into hiding at the end of Dark Knight after choosing to take the fall for murders attached to Harvey Dent's descent into madness and transformation into Two-Face. Even though Commissioner Gordon knew Batman was innocent, he was forced to pretend to pursue him and publicly label Batman a criminal and a murderer. Batman himself understood 
understood the importance of maintaining the faith people had in Dent and in the system. To protect Gotham from devolving into chaos like the Joker wanted, the system and those who operated within it needed to be viewed as the real heroes at this time. And in many alternate universes, not Everyone who has played the role of Batman has acted as heroically as the main continuity Bruce Wayne has. In the Tales from the Dark Multiverse series, we get to see a world where Azrael stayed as Batman and turned Gotham into an ironclad, fascist ruled dystopian nightmare. And in this reality, even when Bruce does get the title back, his views and approach appear to be just as bleak and horrifying. It's like, oh, actually, maybe now Bruce is worse. Bruce got messed up. Yo, that whole series is messed up. If you guys want to read something messed up, go read it. Number two, X Men. Or rather, really, just all of mutant kind, even. Any superhero that is a mutant is automatically hated just for being a mutant. Why? Because racism. Although mutants were originally created from a writing standpoint to get rid of the nuisance of an origin story, explaining away any need for one with the simple phrase, they're a mutant, people quickly started drawing parallels between mutants and the civil rights movement, which was really heating up at the time. Although it's hard to pin down the exact starting date, a big moment for the civil rights movement first happened in 1955, when Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat to a white passenger on a bus in Montgomery. The first issue of Uncanny X-Men was released in 1963, eight years later, and people's minds started to unite the two causes, making the fictional mutants the parallel for all the real world races that had experienced racism. And people's minds started to unite the two causes, making the fictional mutants the parallel for all real world minorities that had experienced racism. As such, the mutants themselves have to face a bigger world of hate in the comics since their introduction, fighting the good fight for mutant rights. They likely have had actually more more hate groups than one could even count. I don't even know how many hate groups they had. I, I've no, I know it's a lot. I could definitely list at least 10 of them. Number one. Watchmen. In the series Watchmen, superheroes are constantly criticized. Originally, the supers actually had to agree to disband due to the public's opinions of their existence. Ozymandias' whole plan is to put supers back on top, creating a situation where they can be seen as saving the day, and in saving the world after kind of terrifying it, bringing everyone together to create a time of peace. Part of his plan is even to make Dr. Manhattan hated by everyone to get him out of his way, which worked. That, that worked pretty well. Also, Dr. Manhattan is just kind of like, like humanity, what is that? But even Adrian Veidt's brilliant master plan doesn't end up panning out when Rorschach's journals are published, revealing that Ozymandias was the one responsible for the alien squid attack on New York. As a result, supers become even more hated and Adrian Veidt is forced to go into hiding. So really the Watchmen universe, just no one likes the Watchmen. I mean I like the Watchmen, but I don't count.